I'm David Gregg, Executive Director of the Rhode Island Natural History Survey. In an ordinary year, the Natural History Survey awards for extraordinary accomplishments of a natural historical nature are awarded at the social event we hold at the Quonset Oak Club. But this is anything but an ordinary year. This is 2020. Therefore, we're presenting our awards in accordance with COVID-19 safety guidelines in front of a video camera. And we'll make this available to everyone at a later time. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Lou Perotti. Uh, I'm the conservation director for the Roger Williams Park Zoo and proud to be a board member of the Rhode Island Natural History Survey. Um, tonight, I'm really honored and excited to be able to present to you tonight one of our, I think, most prestigious awards, our Golden Eye Award, um, an award that we usually present to folks who have made an observation of any kind of flora or fauna in the state that they felt might have some significant uh, benefit um, and went out of their way to actually report that sighting. And our past Golden Eye winners for the discovery of the Diamondback Terrapin, which has led now to widespread surveys throughout the state, discovering new populations um, as we speak, um, and leading to uh, you know, ongoing conservation to make sure these species remain on our planet. So without these, these sharp eyes, and in one case tonight, sharp ears, um, you know, we're happy to be able to present these folks with a recognition uh, to the significance of, of what they have reported and, and um, you know, uh, alerted us to. So tonight, our first uh, award winner, um, Bill Sharkey, um, you know, we have no lizards in the state of Rhode Island. And, and being a kid for, God, now I'm an adult, uh, for 40 years, or probably over 40 years of looking for uh, reptiles and amphibians in Rhode Island, um, you know, I know the significance of both of these award winners tonight, but especially Bill's. You know, we have no lizards in our state, so to have a report of a lizard uh, was pretty significant finding. And, you know, previous to Bill's um, discovery, we actually had another report of this species, the five-line skink, um, which is, you know, found just uh, west of the Connecticut River Valley, hasn't really been reported in Rhode Island, um, but not unlikely for it to be here. But we did have a discovery that was uh, reported to us. Um, we acted upon it. Um, we went out, we looked for more lizards, we couldn't find them. Um, but it did get a lot of press attention and the word got out there. And Bill uh, actually saw some of this press attention and said, wow, I've been, I've been seeing these lizards on my property. And just recently here, I found this, this unfortunately deceased specimen. Would you guys like it? Which then now has sparked us to look for this, now hopefully a range extension, uh, maybe a breeding population. Could it be? There's a lot of speculation as to whether this population could be introduced um, via firewood or shipments. Um, but we don't know. But it has now sparked our, our interest and um, which is why we want to present tonight Bill with this award um, for his significant discovery that now could lead to a, a significant finding um, in the herpetological world and uh, the state of Rhode Island for now a, a lizard species that hadn't been seen uh, up till now. So with that, Bill, I'd like to uh, present you tonight with tonight's uh, Golden Eye Award. Thank you, Lou. I really appreciate this. Uh, I'm honored to get this award. For most of my life, I've been flipping boards over and looking under rocks, finding cool stuff all over the place. And um, my experience is I've never seen a lizard before in those 40 years of flipping rocks or 50 years of flipping rocks and boards over. And uh, to find this was pretty exciting for me. And that's why I thought it was important to bring it to somebody's attention that may know more. So uh, thanks again. I'm honored to have this. And I'm going to cherish this award uh, and put it with uh, my other significant achievements. Thank you. So our second Golden Eye Award uh, tonight goes to Suzanne Payton. 
And, you know, not for shop eyes, not for lifting logs, not for, um, you know, going out there with binoculars, but for her shop ears. And tonight's species of uh, discovery is our only state endangered uh, amphibian, which is the Eastern Spadefoot Toad. Um, up until this discovery, it was only known to two localities, um, very precarious populations, um, not a lot of genetic swapping going around. Um, we were very concerned about them. Um, conservation action had taken place uh, with a bunch of partners, including the Rhode Island Natural History Survey, um, to start to actually look at the habitat of this animal and build artificial breeding sites for the spadefoot toad. Um, hoping to save our only two populations that we knew of. Well, on one strange, uh, weird weather event late summer um, in 2019, um, Suzanne's sharp ears heard this strange call. And uh, if anybody's ever heard the Eastern Spadefoot, it kind of sounds like a sick sheep, kind of like a bleh. Um, and Suzanne spotted that bleh. and said, hmm, I haven't heard that before. That's kind of strange. And most people would have just, you know, scoffed that off, oh, maybe it's some weird bird or, but no, Suzanne knew that it was something, something special. And that observation um, led to us now discovering another breeding population and not just one individual, but a breeding population that had now reproduced um, in, a, in a pool that was uh, threatened to be dried out um, because it was a really weird freak, one of those hard, hard rain events that trigger breeding in spadefoots. But unfortunately, they bred in a, an unsuitable place um, at that time. But it enabled us to be able to rescue up to 800 tadpoles out of that pool, um, which were captive raised, um, head started, and then re-released back into that, that site, as well as seeding some of the new sites that we had started to create for this conservation initiative. So with that, um, and you know, as with um, you know, the skink discovery and the terrapin discoveries, this now has led to a much wider survey effort um, with the state of Rhode Island, Department of Environmental Management, Rhode Island Natural History Survey and many other partners who have gone out there now and starting to do surveys for the species and now finding an additional populations. So again, um, you know, the importance of the recognition of the people that have contributed to this now ongoing research and conservation efforts is priceless. And, you know, with that, I'm honored to present to you, to Suzanne Payton tonight, our Golden Eye Award for her significant discovery of the Eastern Spadefoot Toad in Rhode Island. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. And I honestly feel like I just happened to be in the right place at the right time. Um, I was sitting at my desk in my office, hearing them calling outside my window. Um, but I was so grateful for the overwhelming uh, response of the conservation community and all the organizations that have already been doing spadefoot work in the state, um, the University of Rhode Island, uh, the state DEM, the, the zoo, the natural history survey, um, and working then with the US Fish and Wildlife Service and multiple land trusts, we've been able to advance conservation since that time. So um, I'm just so grateful to be a part of that, that larger partnership and um, looking forward to continuing to try and do good things for the species. So thank you very much, I appreciate it. This year, the Board of Directors of the Rhode Island Natural History Survey instituted a new award, the Rhode Island Natural History Survey Founders Award for Exceptional Service, which is just what it says it is. It was an easy decision to recognize with the inaugural Founders Award the exceptional service done for the Natural History Survey by the Sharp family, including Hank and Peggy Sharp, as well as Julie and Henry Sharp, who have collectively done so much to get the survey where it is today. The presentation of the award was made via a Zoom call with myself, two founding board members, Pete August and Keith Killingbeck, and the Sharps.
and you all know, but the, the Rhode Island Natural History Survey is introducing a new award this year to recognize dedicated service to the survey. Uh, the award is called the Rhode Island Natural History Survey Founders Award for Exceptional Service. And part of it reads like this. Uh, this award denotes the volunteer efforts and commitment by so many people who laid the foundation for the organization. The spirit of volunteerism is something we wish to acknowledge, to celebrate, and to honor. Many of our organizational heroes have worked in the shadows for decades, and we want to recognize their contributions. Uh, your, your contributions have been many and long standing. What you've done for the success of the survey has been absolutely essential. And in fact, I, we wouldn't be, we absolutely would not be where we are without your support. And it's taken all kinds of forms. And when the board discussed the, uh, the new award, the board voted unanimously that it should be the Sharp family to be the first, who would be the first recipients. So, um, it's really our collective honor, my personal pleasure, to congratulate you for that. Now, we were thinking of making a building a giant granite monument, <laughs> but you know, so ah! monuments are so passe now <laughs> that we decided to do something a little bit differently, and so. What we're doing, and when I say we, it's going to be David. David has found this beautiful piece of cherry. Um, and Oh, he's got it. Excellent. And that is going to be the base of a perpetual plaque for this award. And the Sharp family will be the first brass plate wow. on that award. Aww. So... Um, it, just uh, again, congratulations. Um, the, the survey could not have done what it's done without without you. And so we you have our, our heartfelt thanks for all that. Wow. And, and, and David and, and Pete wanted to say a few things too. David, you're up. So I um, the board put this award together and it it recognizes, you know, expresses their gratitude for your help. But I wanted to thank you personally because, uh, Julie, you and I served as board members together before I became the director. <laughs> That's right. right. And it meant that when I became the director and in a new organization and knew nothing and nobody, you were a friendly face who I could talk to about stuff. And that friendship continues. We talk on the phone about all kinds of stuff. And I like today. <laughs> <laughs> and I really appreciate. I really appreciate I have appreciated from the day I started uh, your help in many ways. So I'm I'm grateful. Uh, and Peggy uh, and Hank, I early on in the survey, I had tea at your house at Pojack Point, and we talked about conservation in Rhode Island. And you told me, who was brand new executive director and didn't really know much, <laughs> you told me what you thought was important and what it would be good to get on with. And again, I'm really grateful and I welcome this opportunity to express that gratitude uh, to you for your help. So thank you very well, much. It's been a beautiful, long friendship between all of us, I think. Yes, and yes, yeah. yes. and it's not over either. Let me let that's me that's right, Henry. <laughs> let me take off on a theme that that David just brought up. Uh, Keith and I were reflecting a couple of weeks ago on all the different ways that two generations of the Sharp family have contributed to the survey, and. Um, being so senile and ADD, our conversation wandered to all the, wait, wait a minute. <laughs> all the other important programs that both generations of Sharps were 
key central founders and and volunteers to get them going. And I'm thinking the Nature Conservancy. Um, I'm thinking, uh, Peggy, your role in getting recycling happening in the state. Uh, I remember one time giving a talk at your request at, at, uh, at a big recycling uh, conference in North Kingstown and you were, you were totally in charge. Certainly the CSC, um, both generations of Sharps were influential in that. Everything that you've done for the land trust in the state, everything that you've done for invasive control, not just talking about it. Every time I would see Peggy for months <laughs> on end, she would be talking about getting rid of this and that in the backyard of the Bojack Point. Mm -hmm. So by the time that Keith and I finished this discussion, we were both exhausted <laughs> with all the work that, that uh, the whole Sharp clan has done. And um, three words, three words come to my mind. I'm grateful, very grateful for everything that you've done. I'm, I'm happy that the survey is honoring your, your commitment to volunteerism to build great programs. And I'm very, very proud of uh, everything both generations have done. So congratulations and thank you. Well, we are so humbled by that. And so to have you, the three of, of you, of all people, want to do that. I think it's just a treasure, a treasure. I agree. I, um, it's been the most fun. Um, I, I, I'm one of those people who put my uh, professors on a pedestal and Keith and Pete, to a certain extent, I've been your student and just would love to have like a brain drain so I could know as much as you are as you do and um and i i have to say that that being on that board and the lasting uh friendships have been such a just such a joy and um more fun and exciting um more bonding such a bond and a common purpose of um you know, tracking down critters and plants and, and, you know, just the love for all those things that bring us all together. Um, it's just been, um, it's been great. I, I also just uh, feel so lucky to have the ability to continue. It's, you know, the, to, to say that the commitment is not just today or while I'm in the, on the board or involved that we've been able to try to set up a constant support for the activities of the survey and um, to keep it always relevant and important. And, um, and I mean, honestly, I was on the phone with David uh, two days ago going, David, I, you know, I'm working on a project and I need to know what these stars mean these crosses <laughs> and um <clears throat> anyway it was just it's just great and and um it's just been a light in my life for sure and i'm so grateful to you all to be you know friends and to be on this call today i mean really great Thank well you. it you know it got me thinking about <coughs> the reviewing some of the early days that we're talking about and you know uh about the end of the 60s which was such a horrendous time of change and cultural awakening if you will uh lisa cool came to town she came to the uri to study uh zoology i think and ended up working afterwards for all kinds of people getting so expert on all the plants and species and that was a an inspiration in itself about that time i was asked to join the national board of the nature conservancy and i was you know i'd been awfully interested in all these things but i was you know just opening my ears and uh Robert Jenkins, who was the chief scientist, the first chief scientist of the Nature Conservancy, who started the natural heritage programs 
<laughs> was every day, every week, every meeting, there was some new wonderful thing that was happening. Some other state was coming aboard, doing their planning, getting their lists, you know. And, you know, it was a little sad when they actually uh, <clears throat> decided that people were in the mix and not just endangered species. So they kind of shifted uh, and uh, in the <clears throat> end of the century, they decided to let the heritage program, the Nature Conservancy go into uh, a nature serve itself rather than being part of it. But somehow Robert Jenkins got lost lost in the mix. But I, I remember, you know, <clears throat> I was thrilled and so proud of Rhode Island, who was in on that so early and was doing things, all kinds of things. There were every town, every city, every area was being thought about. And of course, then along comes Julie and she gets married to my son in the middle of all this. And she, of course, was, I, nobody needs to say how passionate she has been all these years, but you know, in order to support not only your family and what they love, but also to carry on, as Julie said, it's just so much fun. And even this guy here who uh, <coughs> was able to travel so many of the meetings across the country and talk, walk so many of the trails and you know, see so many of the beautiful places that the Conservancy was protecting and in Rhode Island, all those beautiful places, uh, he would go home and write poems about them. So <laughs> but I think even at, in his business, he promoted, you know, uh, a love of the natural world. So we thank you, thank you, thank you so much for all that. Yes, sir. So uh, all this came about, Pete and uh, Keith call up one day, and they're all full of camaraderie and laughs. <laughs> like, you've got like Laurel and Hardy, or maybe the Smothers Brothers on the <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And they're all reminiscing one joke after another about all these old times together. And eventually they get around to telling us that they like to give us, us, imagine, an award. And I thought, gosh, that's pretty funny. How come? <laughs> well, because, of course, despite like their demeanor to say nothing of their long commitment, they're the guys who deserve the award. They didn't want us to bring that up, but I just have to tell you. Yeah. You guys have been just unreal, unreal. And it's just humbling to be uh, around you. Cause it, but of course, you know, they ducked and deflected and they got persuasive and they, you know, here we are. And now we're getting the award. And so like, what a place to have two guys with the, their smiling stature telling us that we deserve some kind of award. Well, that's really pretty darn special. Yeah. So I thought about, like what the conservancy, uh, not the conservancy, sorry, mom, you got me on the wrong track. Um, the, what the uh, sure. uh, Natural History Survey means to us and like why it matters so much. I was thinking about it. I've read an incredible book that I really uh, recommend to everybody. It's called Nature's Trust by Mary Wood. And she kind of makes the points, these are not my points, they're really largely based on her points, that so much of our environmental effort nowadays is geared to an outdated model that's based on the sort of recognition of an extractive economy and one that's premised on scarcity and on our, our rights as both individuals and corporations to, uh, uh, increasingly extract things of higher and higher value, but a smaller and smaller share of what's left of it. So for the past 50 years, our policy, it seems to me, has focused on this regulatory permit approach about limiting extractions of things like timber or minerals or uh, wetland resources, whatever. And like we do some funny things. We actually condone pollution by permitting and regulating the amount of it that we discharge into our air and our water. 
and we permit the removal of forests. And lost in all that is the idea that across the board, the things that we value most, um, the things that life, all life, depends on, gradually dwindle and decline until the webs between them are broken and they break down and all those living habitats suddenly break. Air quality seems like it's declined. You know, some can say, you know, there have been improvements in both air and water, but I don't know. It seems to me at least that they are in decline. Forests literally go up and smoke. Fisheries collapse. Um, species vanish. Whole habitats. Uh, just the connection between multiple species disappear all faster and faster. So looking backwards, you just have to conclude that despite everybody's, I think, good intentions, the model we've been using to protect our environment just doesn't work. So what's unique about the survey, it seems to me, is that it champions a different view. It's kind of at the nexus of a change perspective. And it's one, <coughs> excuse me, that champions the idea that all natural systems, air, water, all the creatures and plants, the balance between them that's so, so necessary have inherent value unto themselves, not because somebody wants them or thinks they're valuable for some human related reason. And further, that they form the basis for a perpetual trust, um, one that's based not on scarcity, but on abundance, and that needs to be preserved just because of its abundance. This work, your work, sets the stage for that kind of idea. It's essential to thinking about environment in a sustainable way. And it's premised not on those extractive rights, but again, on our fiduciary duty to protect, uh, I think you'll be thrilled to hear about ecosystem services, Julie. <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, they, those things, they provide an endowment for all of our future. So the work the survey does is this paradigm shift that's right there that's critical to making our future happen because it's based on this idea of abundance and the fact that all of it matters just because of it's kind of because it is so guys thanks for that you know you guys have been carrying that torch and to have an award from guys who have been doing the hard work that you all have been doing yeah. is quite a privilege so that's why the survey matters to our family and why we're so thrilled to get your award. Thank you. Yeah. Nicely put, all of you. And um, the thanks goes the other way to, to the four of you for uh, what you've done, what you've felt, um, how you've supported the survey. It's meant an amazing amount again to to where the survey is right now and um the the thanks is all to you not not to us there so, you go again i it's all right <laughs> <it's all. laughs> don't worry henry we'll get them at some point <laughs> it has nothing to do with their gregarious natures either you know <laughs> Hi, my name is Sarah Gaines. I'm a board member of the Rhode Island Natural History Survey, and I'd just like to explain a little bit about our Distinguished Naturalist Award. The Rhode Island Distinguished Naturalist Award is the highest honor bestowed by the Rhode Island Natural History Survey. A distinguished naturalist is someone who has excelled in one or more of the following categories. Firstly, significantly advanced scientific knowledge of Rhode Island's organisms, geology, and ecosystems, as evidenced by published books, scientific papers, and monographs. Secondly, is recognized as an outstanding teacher and educator to students and the public on the form, functions, and ecological significance of Rhode Island's plants, animals, geology, and natural systems. And thirdly, contributed considerably to enhanced public awareness of the importance of understanding the natural history of Rhode Island's ecosystems. So just to recap, a uh, distinguished naturalist has excelled in one or more of either um, uh, contributions to scientific knowledge, teaching, or public awareness raising on natural history. 
Uh, and nominations are often made by people who particularly inspired by this uh, nominator's own interest in local natural history. So this distinguished naturalist is often a mentor or a role model for members of the board or other members of our community in the Rhode Island Natural History Survey. And over a long period, this um, distinguished naturalist has exhibited particularly creative uh, pursuits of scientific questions about Rhode Island's animals, plants, and natural communities or who has maintained a notable public profile in the state with their ability to communicate natural historical knowledge. So over the years, this award has gone to many extremely distinguished naturalists. It has become an expression of the deep and abiding respect our whole community holds for these individuals with their years of experience studying Rhode Island ecosystems and communicating their knowledge and understanding. And I just like to stress that this uh, award is not given only to professional naturalists. We, in fact, even prefer to give it to amateur naturalists. And so it's not um, a recognition of credentials, but really a recognition of contribution to our community as a whole and our state's understanding of our natural systems. Hello folks, my name is Bob Kenny, and I've been a member of the Natural History Survey Board of Directors for going on 20 years now. I also chaired the advisory committee for the Audubon Society's Kimball Wildlife Refuge for about 25 years. Today, it is my honor and great pleasure to present the 2020 Rhode Island Natural History Survey Posthumous Distinguished Naturalist Award to Mary Jo Murray. Mary Jo was a dedicated birder and lifelong educator who passed away at the age of 98, just over a year ago in October 2019. It makes me very sad that she's not here to receive this honor herself. But there is one thing that does make me feel a little bit better. You've seen a photo of her already with a big smile on her face. That was taken in November 2015 when we dedicated a bench in her honor at the Truston Pond National Wildlife Refuge. And I was standing right next to her when she, when she got that award, making the presentation. So she did get to hear me at least one time tell everyone about what an inspiration she was. Mary Jo retired from one decades long career and then started a second one almost as long, spreading her enthusiasm for birds and the national environment all across Rhode Island. In 1938, at the age of 17, she began her teaching career in a one room schoolhouse in Advance, Missouri. Forty years later, she retired as a reading teacher in Dansville, New York. Along the way, she also earned a master's in education from the University of West Virginia. After her husband also retired, they moved here to Rhode Island to be closer to their grandchildren. Mary Jo had always been an avid birder, so once in Rhode Island, she immediately started birding around South County. On one of those trips one day, she met the late Doug Krauss. Doug was our distinguished naturalist in 1998. He brought her along to a Kimball Advisory Committee meeting. That committee was a group of volunteers who did all of the public programming for the Kimball Wildlife Refuge in Charlestown. She joined us in the spring of 1990, which would have been just after I took over as the committee chair. She jumped right in as an active participant right from the very beginning. She volunteered to chair our publicity subcommittee. Publicity in those days meant printing flyers and sticking them in libraries all around the state. At a point in her life when you might think she would think about slowing down, she did the opposite. She very quickly suggested that we offer regular birding programs in the middle of the week, and she volunteered to lead them. By September of 1992, the weekly Tuesday morning bird walks had been firmly established. For the next 15 plus years, a dedicated group of birders would meet at the mini super in Charlestown on Tuesday morning at eight o'clock and then they headed off to her destination of the week. Sometimes they stayed close to home. Other days they might go as far afield as the Cape or Block Island or Hammonasset State Park in Connecticut. Eventually she decided that it was getting to be too much for her. So she convinced Phil Budlong, another committee member to take over. Even though Phil took over as group leader, Mary Jo still kept going every week. It wasn't the birding that got too much for her, it was the planning. Uh, after Phil died a few years later, the Tuesday morning walks almost went away because we didn't have another committee member who was ready to do something weekly. 
So they were adopted as an official program by the Audubon Society. They were continued by Laura Carberry from the Fisherville Brook Wildlife Refuge. And they're still going, she, she's back. COVID shut her down for the summer, but she's offering her Wednesday morning bird walks now. And Audubon kept right on expanding what Mary Jo had started. This past spring, the plan was to offer a free bird walk someplace in Rhode Island every day of the month of May until COVID interfered. Mary Jo is remembered around South County for quite a number of things. She was incredibly patient with explaining how to locate a bird in a tree across the way, or how to identify it, how to match it to other things. A large numbers of people credit her for developing their interest in birds and in the rest of the natural world. She was always full of good spirits and provided lots of encouragement. In 2008, the Audubon Society of Rhode Island presented her with their Volunteer of the Year Award. When that bench was installed at Trust and Pond in her honor, it was paid for more, more money than was needed by donations from all of her birding friends. For her nomination for this Distinguished Naturalist Award, I got endorsements from every former member of the Kimball Committee that I could get in touch with, the entire staff and board of the Audubon Society, and about 30 more of her friends from her bird walks. The, even people who never went out with her, but are still going with Laura's walks, know who she was. One of the things people remember the most about her was what she said whenever anyone questioned whether it was okay to go on to a, a piece of private property. Don't worry, I've got permission. Whether or not it was really true every time has to stay a mystery today. An important part of our quality of life in South County and the rest of Rhode Island is the natural environment around us. To keep it the way we need to leave to keep it that way, we need to leave some areas relatively undeveloped. By getting so many people interested in birds, bird watching, and the natural world over the year, Mary Jo Murray single-handedly created a group of citizens who are dedicated to preserving as much as possible of whatever natural environment we have left. I'm Joanne Sullivan, Mary Jo Murray's daughter. Mary Jo was the seventh of nine siblings growing up on a small farm in Southeast Missouri in the 1920s and early 30s, in a town correctly pronounced as Advance, Missouri. <laughs> she surprised her siblings by becoming an English teacher and an amateur naturalist when they mostly expected her to become a professional naturalist, given her profound love and interest in the natural world. Mom moved to Rhode Island at the age of 68 and immediately threw herself into her first love, learning and sharing what she had learned about birds. One of her first projects was helping URI ornithologist Bill Edelman with his research on nesting birds of Rhode Island. But she also soon began leading weekly bird walks for fellow experts and novice watchers alike. When she wasn't helping with Kimball Wildlife, Cherahoe Middle School bird watching, Fish and Wildlife, or Christmas bird counts, she was particularly inspiring novice bird watchers. Scores of people have approached me to tell me how she initiated them, oops, into an interest in birds. Even after her passing, one of my colleagues told me after hearing about her exploits at Mary Jo's memorial service, that she went out and bought a field guide, set up home bird feeders, and that her two preschool children now have become avid identifiers of the birds that they see. In other words, she's initiated a possible lifetime of concern about the natural world among a number of people. This is a legacy to be very proud of, and I thank the organization for recognizing her for this. Thank you very much. The recipient of the 2020 Rhode Island Natural History Survey Distinguished Naturalist Award is Dick Farron. 
the nomination for Dick was provided by Chris Raithel. Hi, my name is Chris Raithel. I was a wildlife biologist for the Division of Fish and Wildlife for almost 40 years. And uh, in my job, which was to do conservation planning for animals, I had some really wonderful mentors. And Dick Farron was probably the most significant mentor I encountered in my career. I first met Dick around 1980, uh, where, where uh, I was a zoologist for the program, and so we were supposed to do some summaries of bird status, nesting bird status in the state. So I worked with a guy at that time named Jim Myers, and so Jim said, well, you could, this is one guy you got to meet, he's Dick Farron. So Rick Enser and I and Jim Myers piled into a car, and we went up to visit Dick at his home in Lenox, Massachusetts. What ensued there was a, a two-day deep dive into bird status in Rhode Island, basically two days and one solid night. And I came out of there with my head swimming, and my, my first thought was, man, I, gotta, I, gotta, I wanna know what this guy knows. Because what became clear to me is that he had examined every shred of bird documentation that existed in the state. All of the collections, all of the shooting records, all of the egg collections, all of the, all of the site observations, everything that existed, including his own observations, he had synthesized and put into this opus magnum work and his encyclopedic memory of all these little events was, was just unbelievable. And this came up a number of times because when I got to know him a little bit, I would say something like, well, I saw, I saw a chickadee the other day down at Satchewest Point, and he would say, well, you know, that's the furthest south anybody's ever seen a chickadee on, on Aquidneck Island within two days of the autumnal equinox. And I would go, oh, that's, that's great, you know. And he said, well, furthermore, that site, I used to, that used to be the Middletown Town Dump, but I used to go over there as a kid and look at gulls, and it would just go on and on like this. The stream of fact, factual uh, consciousness would just go until something else happened, and you break the train of thought. So he just had this incredible, uh, total grasp of everything that had ever happened in Rhode Island, every bird basically in Rhode Island. So I didn't, uh, so, so a little, little bit later, I ran into him again at Napa Tree Point. I was just going down and look at some birds, and... I saw him sitting on the dune with his telescope. So he knew who I was and he invited me to come over and sit down. And that was the beginning of what he used to call diurnal migration watching, which was sitting with a telescope and just watching all the birds stream by Watch Hill, you know, from cormorants to hawks and every other thing. And we sat there for hours and hours at a time. I mean, he would, he would sit there from dawn to dusk, sleep in his car and get up the next day and do it again. And I, I didn't have that kind of endurance, but in the course of looking at these birds and, and talking to him about all the stuff that was going on with the birds, I realized that this, this guy was a, was a transitional legacy figure that, that, that transcended um, the diurnal migration watching that used to happen in the days of Roland Clement and Jim Baird and even earlier, and even the gunners knew that birds migrated along the coast. But this guy was the next in line, and I was fortunate enough to be able to sit with him and absorb some of this information. I'll tell you, even to this day, although I don't do it with Dick anymore, uh, I still get charged up watching these birds come through the coast. It's one of the most magnificent spectacles. As Farron would say, the, the changing tapestry of birds. So uh, around this time, in the middle, early 80s, we were doing the Breeding Bird Atlas, and Rick was basically coordinating this. and so. Dick was always really interested in, in the status of nesting birds, almost more so than anything. And so he wanted to really plug into the atlas. He had all these theories about the distribution of birds and the abundances and how they related to abiotic features, such as the, the climate and the soils and everything, and you know, Pangaea. And um, so for about five years in a row, he came to Rhode Island, spent a week in the woods and basically lived out of his car and got up every day, walked through a new area, and, and hissed down and counted every bird he saw. So at the end of these excursions, he would write up a summary with a tally of all the birds he had encountered, and then put some kind of uh, qualification on it in terms of the, the habitats that he saw, the vegetation, and uh, the climate, and w things that he thought would help explain these patterns. And I, you know, I can't attribute cause and effect to the things that he said, but I know that the patterns that he noticed are real. Because when we got done looking at the bird atlas, it was actually exactly, exactly how he said it was going to be. So he knew about the bird atlas before we even did it. The next thing I just wanted to talk about briefly is the, the, the Bay Survey, the Survey of Colonial Water Birds. And uh, again, there was there were some people that were interested in water birds back in the 60s, primarily Roland Clement, Dave Emerson, and Jim Baird, and Bob Woodruff, and others. This is going back into the 50s and 60s. 
Bowen Dick uh, came along, he somehow talked Jim Myers into, into formalizing this survey using the state of uh, boats and stuff. And they began to survey all the islands in Narragansett Bay uh, starting in 1977. And so for a, virtually an unbroken string, Farron and Dick Myers, and I would go along sometimes, they would visit every island, count everything that nested there, and put this into a tally sheet that, that culminated in a, in a book about the birds in Narragansett Bay, which was published in the 90s. Uh, very hard to obtain now, but it still exists. And so when Jim Myers retired, I was, I was basically handed the torch. And so Dick and I began to do this, again, with state resources. And um, I tell you, spend, I mean, it was, it was rugged, let me tell you, but you know, spending two weeks with him in a boat, at the end of two weeks, I mean, I wanted to go run into the, uh, and hide and stick my head in the sand, but you know, visiting those places over and over and over again and listening to these running narratives about, oh, this, you know, this used to be this and that, the birds used to nest here, and then they built a bridge and they disappeared, and, all this stuff, I and mean, we made great discoveries, but just, just spending that time out on the bay, looking at this stuff and listening to him narrate, I mean, I mostly listened, he talked, and uh, just an, an incredible experience, and I'm so, uh, so fortunate that I had that. Um, and that's all I really wanted to say about that, but um, I just, you know, he, Dick, it's not, not unfair to say that D Dick changed, modified, or formed my whole outlook upon watching birds. Nowadays, there's more of a uh, tendency for people to go chase stuff around, but Dick showed me a couple of things. One of which, which I've never lost sight of, was that sometimes it's just well enough to sit in one spot and watch what goes by, just wait for stuff to go by, and to be satisfied with everything you see. Because everything, like the chickadee I mentioned at Satchewa's point, everything is interesting. And so if you have that passion where you can, you, where you can admire a flock of starlings, or the, or the delicate plumage of a breeding herring gull, or whatever it would be, if you can get to that point where you're satisfied with everything you see, then to me, that's represented, uh, that's kind of my, my bird nirvana. And Dick showed me that, the, the, the idea that you could just sit there and watch the stuff go by and didn't have to chase it down, the stuff would come to you. And also, you know, his passion for detail, I can't even, I mean, I, I would hope to think that I could learn as much as he did, but it's not gonna happen. So I got as, I soaked up as much as I could, took it in some cases further, but he was a, he was a tremendous asset and I hope a lot of his un, unwritten, I hope his manuscript gets published someday because it's be an invaluable resource to anybody uh, concerned with the birds of Rhode Island. So that's all I want to say, thank you. Birders sometimes speak of a spark bird, the first bird that really grabbed their attention, often at an early age a bird that sparked their love of birding. It may be a bird as common as a robin or something more exotic like a roseate spoonbill. For Ray Larson, the recipient of this year's Rhode Island Natural History Survey Distinguished Naturalist Award, it was more of a spark project. As a fourth grade student, Ray joined his class in using Audubon birding kits his teacher had ordered. By the time a year had passed, Ray had recorded 17 species, not bad for a nine-year-old. Dr. Larson was a physician in the U.S. Navy and served as ship's surgeon in submarines. In 1963, while stationed in New London, Ray would pursue his other passion in life, bird watching, often at Napa Tree Point Conservation Area. Though his work took him around the world, he eventually settled in Rhode Island. When he did, he began to inventory birds across the state maintaining meticulous records of what he observed and where. Nearly 60 years later, Reynold Larson has submitted over 6,000 checklists to the Cornell Lab of Ornithology's eBird database. His lists document 297 bird species from Rhode Island. These numbers are astonishing and have made a significant contribution to the body of knowledge surrounding Rhode Island's birds, their migrations, and habitats. His expertise in other winged creatures led him to produce over 470 damselfly and dragonfly records while working with biologist Ginger Brown in assembling an atlas of Rhode Island's Odinate. He has mentored innumerable naturalists, students, and birders as they find their own spark birds. Today, Ray still patrols 
the Rhode Island shoreline, carefully recording his observations and sharing his discoveries with everyone interested. Here are some of the comments made by those with firsthand knowledge of Reynold Larson's extraordinary dedication. Our most stalwart and dedicated volunteer, Reynold Ray Larson, started counting birds at Napa Tree on a cool, foggy morning on November 23, 1963. Since then, Ray has returned to Napa Tree 626 times over the last 54 years to tally 228,393 individual birds of 174 species. Although Ray, although Ray precedes the millennials and Gen Xers, he uses all the latest tools to record and share his bird observations. He ranks as the top e-birder in the state in terms of total checklists submitted, 6,090. Number two has submitted 5,282 checklists, with most top e-birders submitting for less than 1,000 checklists. Thus, the information he has compiled contributes substantially to our understanding of the, dis of the distribution and abundance of birds in Rhode Island. Napa Tree Point Conservation Area is designated as a globally important bird area by the National Audubon Society. That designation is highly leveraged on Ray's data. Ray produced more than 470 records for the Odenata Atlas and carefully prepared high quality museum specimens to document these records. He willingly slogged the state's ponds and wetlands with great enthusiasm, was a skilled netter of fast-flying dragonflies, and was a great member of the Odenata Atlas team. Ray is a walking Wikipedia of ornithological wisdom. If you are lucky enough to join Ray on a bird survey, you'll be treated to his marvelous wit and historic tidbits as he recalls the last time he recorded a seldom seen species. Quote, the last, whatever it is, I observed here was a female in 1993. A generous mentor, Ray offers natural history information explaining various plumages or territorial ranges to novices. Ray Larson is certainly Napa Tree's most precious natural resource, and I dare say one of Rhode Island's too for his dedication to ornithology, for his significant contributions to the data record of bird diversity and abundance in Rhode Island, which spans six decades, and for his eagerness to share his knowledge with those around him, Reynold T. Larson is a most deserving recipient of the 2020 Rhode Island Natural History Survey Distinguished Naturalist Award. I would like to express my appreciation for this surprising award um, I started at an early age, uh, in the fourth grade, looking at birds, um, and uh, never got away from it. Uh, there were periods of time when I was submerged in submarines, uh, when it was particularly difficult. But on one occasion, in the Norwegian Sea, very cold waters. Uh, I got a look through the periscope uh, of the telescope and saw a northern fulmar. It's been my only periscopic observation all through these years. Uh, the accumulated notes, lists, and so forth were moldering away in my house uh, until some few years ago when uh, Marshall Iloff gave a presentation at the, uh, at the maritime campus of the university of this organization called eBird. And that rang a bell for me and I started digging into records uh, and sending stuff in and sending stuff in and sending stuff in, 6,000, good grief. Um, I've gotten a call back I got an email from uh, an observer in, in Hawaii questioning uh, a record I had sent in of a Harris's sparrow in my hometown in Illinois in, I believe it was 1954, and uh, was able to provide a, 
uh, not a photograph. The only camera I had at that time was a box brownie, but uh, was able to satisfy the interrogators that indeed that bird had been there. Uh, it's been a wonderful experience. I've, I've really done this mostly for my own enjoyment uh, and only at a latter time, and especially with the arrival of the eBird system, uh, was I able to make a significant contribution to ongoing records. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, everybody, for attending our annual awards ceremony. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody who's helped to make this possible, uh, particularly Kyra Stilwell, our program administrator, um, the board of the Natural History Survey, who've done so much to identify our award winners and to um, uh, prepare the citations and, and help bring them and their families here for this. So thank you to everybody who's uh, made this possible and thank you to you for attending. And hopefully we will all meet again in person in the very near future. So thank you. Thank you.